Hello and welcome to Act 2 of Othello, Cathy Williams de Vries here with my re full reading and analysis of Shakespeare's play Othello. <gasps> Excuse me. So what's happening at the start of this second act is uh, we're waiting for Othello's ship to come in um, and it's a really stormy night and um, all the watch don't know whether they're going to make it back in. But uh, a ship does make it in, and it turns out to be Iago with his wife and Desdemona. Um, and they await the return of Othello's boat. Now, this, this second act very neatly sets up the third act in terms of Iago's scheming. Because what happens is Iago, Iago wants Cassio's job. He thought he should have been second in command um, and was quite jealous of Cassio being second in command in the first act. So he sets out to discredit Cassio, um, discovers that he has a light head for drink, gets him drunk and uh, gets his friend to, uh, uh, gets Roderigo to pick a fight with him so that he starts a bit of a barney. Othello hears of it and strips him of his um, lieutenancy and gives it to Iago. But this sets up the third act where, um, where uh, Cassio is uh, sending overtures via Desdemona to get his lieutenantship back from and uh, Iago of course poisons Othello's mind by saying that you know if your wife is sending you overtures from Cassio, therefore they are having an affair. So this, this second act is quite crucial. So we begin with Act 2, Scene 1, and, uh, and uh, Montano, who's the governor of Cyprus, and two other gentlemen are on the watch waiting for a ship. It's a dark and stormy night. The weather's terrible. What from the Cape can you discern at sea? Nothing at all. It is a high wrought flood. Um, and Shakespeare often used the word flood uh, to mean sea. And uh, I find that uh, quite an interesting use of the word flood uh, because for me it brings back biblical refer references of the great flood when the sea was all over the earth. But Shakespeare uses the word flood for sea uh, quite a lot in the place. It's a high wrought flood or um, very rough sea. Um, I cannot twixt the heaven and the main descry sail. So uh, they can't, they can't uh, see for the storm uh, whether there's a sail or not coming, although they're expecting it. The heaven and the main, the heaven and the sea uh, descry, discern. Those words are fairly evident. So uh, Montano is, methinks the wind hath spoke aloud at land a fuller blast ne'er shook our battlements, if it hath ruffians so upon the sea, what ribs of oak, when mountains melt on them, can hold the mortise, what shall we hear of this? So what's saying here is they've never seen wind like that on land, let alone on sea. And uh, how on earth can a boat survive with these mountainous waves breaking over it all the time? So they're, uh, they're a little bit uh, concerned. And uh, it goes on, the second gentleman, a segregation of the Turkish fleet, for do but stand upon the foaming shore, the chidden billow seems to pelt the clouds, the wind-shaped surge with high and monstrous mane seems to cast water on the burning bear and quench the guards of the ever-fixed pole. I never did like molestation view on the entafed flood. So the, um, the segregation of the Turkish fleet, there's a separation of the fleet. Uh, chiddened billow is the surging ocean. Um, chidden uh, chide, so the rebuked ocean uh, by the wind. Chidden, you chide. I love this, the wind shaped surge with high and monstrous mane. So here we've got the alliteration, it's just... Um, and also pelt the clouds as well. 
For do but stand upon, upon the foaming shore, the chidden billow seems to pelt the clouds, the wind-shaped surge with high and monstrous mane seems to cast water on the burning bear, the burning bear that of course is the North Star, and quench the guards of the ever-fixed pole. So this is the constellation of Ursa Minor. I never did like molestation views, never seen the um, never seen the, the ocean so uh, in such turmoil. If that the Turkish fleet be not in Shelton and in Bay, they are drowned. It is impossible to bear it out. So we're not even thinking about Othello yet. Uh, they're saying that uh, with this weather, the Turkish fleet is uh, is done for. If they if they haven't found a safe harbour. A third gentleman comes in. News lads, our wars are done. The desperate tempest hath so banged the Turks that their designment halts, their plan halts. A noble ship of Venice has seen a grievous wreck and suffering on most part of their fleet. So um, one of their ships has seen um, the Turks uh, in disarray. Grievous rack and sufferance. And also Venice sufferance. You've got your um, you've got your rhyme there. How is this true? The ship here is put in a Veronessa, uh, although originally from Verona. It's possibly a cutlet, a cutter. Um, it's that that's un unclear. Uh, Michael Cassio, lieutenant to the warlike Moor Othello, is come on shore, the Moor himself at sea, and is in full commission here for Cyprus. So Cassio's made it to shore, um, and they're still waiting for Othello. I'm glad on it, tis a worthy governor. But this same Cassio, though he speak of comfort touching the Turkish loss, yet he looks sadly or seriously and prays them all be safe, for they were parted with foul and violent tempest. The, um, the imagery here is amazing. Molestation view of the enchafed flood. Um, you know, grievous rack and sufferance. Um, foul and violent tempests. It's, uh, it's just amazing, amazing language. Pray heavens he be, for I have served him, and the man commands like a full soldier. Let's to the seaside, ho, as well to see the vessel that's come in, as to throw out our eyes for brave Othello, even till we make the main and the aerial blue as indistinct regard. So they can't, they can't uh, see the boundary between the sea and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the air. The main and the aerial blue, the, the sea and the sky. Come, let's do so, for every minute is expectancy of more arrivals. So they're expecting more arrivals every minute. Cassio comes in. Thanks, you the valiant of this warlike isle that so approved the more. Oh, let the heavens give him defence against the elements, for I have lost him on a dangerous sea. Defence against the elements. There's your um, alliteration. And heavens. Oh, let the heavens give him defence against the elements. Is he well shipped? His bark is stoutly timbered and his pilot of the very expert and approved allowance. Therefore my hopes, not surfeited to death, stand in bold cure. Here, um, not surfeited to death, are not excessive, uh, stand in bold cure, are likely to be rewarded. So his hopes are likely to be rewarded that Othello's fine. A sail, a sail, a sail. What noise? The town is empty. On the brow of the sea stand ranks of people and they cry a sail. My hopes do shape him for the governor. Uh, make him out to be the governor. There's a shot. They do discharge their shot of courtesy, our friends at least. I pray you, sir, go forth and give us truth who tis that is arrived. I shall. But good lieutenant, is your general wived? Most fortunately he hath achieved, uh, is, he, is he married? Most fortunately he hath achieved a maid that paragons description and wide, wild fame 
one that excels the quirks of blazoning pens and in the essential vesture of creation doth tire the engineer. So he's singing the praises of Desdemona here. That Paragon's description and wild fame so stands above description. Um, you know, even even the the most praising of poets cannot do justice. Um, to tire the engineer in this case, uh, whose natural beauty exhausts the poet's capacity to um, to invent praise. So that's fairly high praise indeed for Desdemona. But it doesn't mean Cassio fancies her. But this is what Iago uses against him to uh, to poison the moor even though we know that Cassio likes Bianca. So how now, who has put in? Tis one Iago, ensign to the general. He's had the most favourable and happy speed, tempests themselves, high seas and howling winds, the gutted rocks, jagged rocks and congregated sands, traitors and steep to enclog the guiltless keel, as having sense of beauty do omit their, do omit their mortal natures, letting go safely by the divine Desdemona. So, you know, the sea, the tempest, the jagged rocks, the accumulated sands, um, underwater, underwater traps, you know, uh, part ways um, in order to let the uh, divine Desdemona through. And you've got this uh, gutted rocks and congregated sands, traitors and steeped to end clog the guiltless keel. Again, amazing, amazing use of language here. As having sense of beauty, do I admit that? Yeah. So, where is she? Oh, what is she? She that I spake of, our great captain's captain, so Captain Othello, yeah. left in the conduct of bold Iago, whose footing here anticipates our thoughts a senate speed. So they hadn't expected him to get there for another week. Senate meaning seven night. Great Jove, a fellow guard, and swell his sail with thine own powerful breath, Jove, of course, being one of the gods, that he may bless this bay with his tall ship, make love quick's pants in Desdemona's arms, give renewed fire to our extincted spirits, and bring all Cyprus comfort. Again, Desdemona's arms give renewed fire to our extincted spirits and bring all Cyprus comfort. <laughs> oh, behold, the riches of this ship is come on shore. You men of Cyprus, let her have your knees. In other words, kneel before her. Hail to thee, lady, and the grace of heaven before, behind thee, and on every hand, and wheel thee around. And Desdemona, I thank you, valiant Cassio. What tidings can you tell me of my lord? He is not yet arrived, nor know I aught, but that he's well, and will be shortly here. Oh, but I fear, have you lost your company? The great contention of the sea and skies parted our fellowship, so he parted ways with um, Othello due to the storm. A sail, a sail, but hark, a sail, a shot comes, rings out. They give their greetings to the citadel. This likewise is a friend's, they don't know yet. See for the news. Good ensign, you are welcome. And then he kisses Amelia. Welcome, mistress. Let it not gall your patience, good Iago, that I extend my manners. Tis my breeding that gives me this bold show of courtesy. So he's a bit of a ladies' man. He's, uh, he's kissed Amelia, I'm, I'm assuming, on the hand. But this is, this is what uh, Iago uses against him, is his way with the ladies. And Iago is... Uh, it's quite uh, disparaging of his wife. Um, Sir, would she give you so much of her lips as of her tongue she oft bestows on me, you would have had enough. <laughs> yeah, I had... Uh, that's, that's quite cutting. As oft her tongue, as her, of her tongue she oft bestows on me. So uh, he's saying that she gives him a hard time, she nags him. And Desdemona says, alas, she has no speech. And uh, she's not rising to her defence. In faith too much, I find it still. 
when I had leave to sleep, Marry, before your ladyship I grant, she puts her tongue a little in her heart and chides with her thinking. In other words, she keeps her critical thoughts to herself. Amelia says, you had little cause to say so. And Iago, he's obviously half teasing, but it is quite malicious. Um, I'm well aware of that because my first husband used to do that to me all the time. Come on, come on, you are pictures out of door, bells in your parlours, wild cats in your kitchen, saints in your injuries, devils being offended, players in your house, whiffery and hussies in your bed. Now this sh um, shifts to women in general, you know, the so that uh, pictures means models of silent proprietary bells. Bells in the parlours is noisy. Um, in the kitchens, wild cats in the kitchens or, des or, or, or de domestic affairs. Saints in your injuries, martyrs. Devils being offended. Players in your house, whiffery. In this way, deceptive in managing household expenses. And hussies in your beds are wanted. But I think hussy is uh, quite, uh, quite self-evident in, even in today's language. And Desdemona says, oh, fie upon thee, slanderer. And then Iago comes back, nay, it is true, or else I am a Turk. You rise to what? You rise to play and go to bed to work, um, implying they're prostitutes. You shall not write my praise. No, let me not. Desdemona says, what wouldst write of me if thou shouldst praise me? And Iago backpedals and says, O gentle lady, do not put me to it, for I am nothing if not critical. Desdemona says, come on a sigh, there's one gone to the harbour. Aye, madam, I am not merry, but I do beguile the thing I am by seeming otherwise. Come, how wouldst thou praise me? So there's a little bit of interplay here um, between Iago and Desdemona, although he's a real he's a real piece of work, he really is. I'm about it, but indeed my invention comes from my pate, as bird lime does from freeze. Bird lime is the sticky substance used to trap small birds, and freeze is a coarse wool cloth, so it comes from his comes from his pate or his head or his mouth. Um, very, very, it's very sticky, it's very hard to get out, and it plucks out brains and all. But my muse labours, um, as in childbirth, for thus she is delivered. If she be fair and wise, fairness and wit, the one's for use, the other uses it. In other words, intelligence makes use of beauty, so. Desdemona says, worse and worse. Amelia says, how fair and foolish. She never yet was foolish that was fair. That's the opposite of blonde jokes. For even her folly helped her to an heir. So, uh, he's saying that fair women aren't necessarily foolish because their looks get them a husband and therefore children. Desdemona says, these are old fond paradoxes to make fools laugh in the alehouse. Um, so, you know, pub talk. What miserable praise hast thou for her that's foul and foolish, or ugly and foolish? There's none so foul and foolish thereunto, but does foul pranks, which fair and wise ones do. So, ugly chicks shouldn't get any, basically. You know, it's just, it's just gross in his, um, in his point of view. O heavy ignorance, thou praisest the worst best. But what praise couldst thou bestow on a deserving woman indeed, one that in the authority of her merit did justly put on the vouch of the very malice itself? It uh, compels the approval. Iago comes back. She that was ever fair and never proud, had tongue at will and yet was never loud, never lacked gold, yet never went gay. 
fled from her wish, and yet said, Now I may. She that being angered, her revenge being nigh, bade her wrong stay, and her displeasure fly. She that in wisdom never was so frail to change the cod's head for the salmon's tail. She that could think and ne'er disclose her mind, see suitors following and not look behind. She was a white, if ever such whites were. To do what? To suckle fools and chronicle small beer. So, um, saying that even though she has a tongue, she's not loud about it. She's rich, but never ostentatious. Being angered, bade, kept her anger at bay. That uh, in wisdom, she would never make an unworthy exchange, exchange the cod's head for the salmon's tail. She could think, yet wouldn't wouldn't say what she was thinking. She would uh, have suitors after her but never give them the time of day. <laughs> to suckle fools and chronicle small wheel, suckle fools are, is to, um, to breastfeed babies and keep track of trivial domestic goods. So that is, such perfect virtue suits only a dull, complacent, decidedly ungeal, genteel housewife. Almost oh, lame and impotent conclusion. Do not learn of him, Amelia, though he be thy husband. How say you, Cassio, is he not a most profane and liberal or outspoken counsellor? Cassio says, he speaks home, madam. You may relish him more in the soldier than in the scholar. So he's a better soldier than he is um, a speaker. Cassio and Desdemona are talking apart. And Iago, in an aside to the audience, uh, commentates on what's happening and reveals a step of his plan. He takes her by the palm. I, well said, whisper, with as little a web as this, I will ensnare a gr as great a fly as Cassio. I smile upon her, do, I will guide thee in thine own courtship. I will tackle thee in his courtliness. He's going to make, he's going to um, hang him by the fact that he's uh, a very courtly gentleman towards the ladies. He's a bit of a ladies' man. You say true, tis so indeed. If such tricks as this strip you out of your lieutenantry, it had better you had not kissed your three fingers so off. So kissing one's own hand was a common courtly gesture from a gentleman to a lady. I went... It had been better you had not kissed your three fingers so oft, which now again you are most aptly to play the sir in. Very good, well kissed, an excellent curtsy, tis so indeed. Yet again your fingers to your lips, would they cluster pipes for your sake? Uh, anima tubes. <laughs> Aloud. The moor, I know his trumpet, tis truly so. Let's meet him and receive him. Lo, where he comes. Othello comes in and says to Desdemona, O oh, my fair warrior, my dear Othello, it gives me wonder great is my content to see you here before me. O oh, my soul's joy, if after every tempest comes such calms. May the winds blow till they have wakened death, and let the labouring bark climb hills of seas, Olympus high, and duck again as low as hells from heaven. If it were now to die, t'were now to be most happy, for I fear my soul hath her content so absolute that not another comfort like to this succeeds in unknown fate. She couldn't be this happy. Again, it's a... Uh, You know, she's, you know, that if she was to die then, you know, she'd be, she'd be the happiest she'd ever been. She'd be very happy to see him. The heavens forbid that our loves and comforts should increase, even as our days do grow. Amen to that sweet powers, I cannot speak enough of this content. It stops me here, it is, it stops me here, it is too much of joy, and this... Uh, they kiss, and this the greatest discords be that e'er our hearts should make. Iago, in another aside, 
says, oh, you're well tuned now, but I'll set down the pegs that make this music, as off honest as I am. So, so well tuned, um, like a, a guitar or a lute, I suppose. But he's going to, and when a lute's well tuned, it sounds nice. But he's going to untune the strings so that what now is perfect music between him and his wife becomes a discord, <laughs> turns sour. Okay, so um, Othello said, Come, let us to the castle. News, friends, our wars are done, the Turks are drowned. Done and drowned. Uh, how does my old acquaintance of this isle, honey, you should be well desired in Cyprus. I have found great love amongst them. Oh, my sweet, I prattle out of fashion and I dote in mine own comforts. I prithee, good Iago, go to the bay and disembark my coffers. Bring now the master to the citadel. He is a good one and his worthiness does challenge much respect. Come, Desdemona, once more, well met at Cyprus. And this is where they hatch the plan. This is where Iago and Rodrigo hatch the plan to um, shame Cassio. And they speak in prose here. Um, they stop speaking in verse. They don't speak again in verse until Iago's final speech of the scene. So Iago, as he goes out, says to an attendant, Do thou meet me presently at the harbour? Then Rodrigo, he says, come hither, if thou beest valiant, as they say, base men being in love, have, a, have then a nobility in their natures that more than is native to them, list me. So that, um, so, because, you know, Rodrigo's in love with Desdemona, there's a certain gentility and nobility in him, being, um, being in love, even though he is lowly born. Lieutenant tonight watches on the court of guard. He's in charge of the wash at the guardhouse. So this is Cassio. First, I must tell thee this. Desdemona is directly in love with him. So, so Iago has told Rodrigo that Desdemona is in love with Cassio. And of course, Rodrigo being in love with Desdemona doesn't like this. So with him, why it is not possible. Okay, so this is the first seeds of doubt. And the first phase in Iago's plan to bring down Cassio. Lay thy finger thus, and let thy soul be instructed. Mark me with what violence she first loved the more, but for bragging and telling her fantastical lies. To love him still for prating? Let not thy discreet heart think about it. Her eye must be fed, and what delight shall she have to look on the devil? Um, he's saying that the moor looks like a devil, that uh, they fell in love in such a whirlwind kind of way that uh, she's likely to fall out of love with him quite quickly. And I mean, that's not the case, but this guy's a piece of work. When the blood is made dull with the act of sport, there should be again to inflame it and to give satiety a fresh appetite. Loveliness in favour, sympathy in years, manners and beauties, all which the moor is defective in. Now, for want of these required conveniences, her delicate tenderness will find itself abused. Begin to heave the gorge, spew, disrelish and abhor, abhor, abhor the moor. Very nature will instruct her in it and compel her to some second choice. In other words, you, Rodrigo. Actually, probably Cassio in this case. Now, sir, this granted, as it is a most pregnant and unforced position. Um, this is quite lewd. Um, it's, it's going on about, uh, it's sexual. Who stands so eminent in the degree of this fortune as Cassio does? So he's saying when Desdemona gets sick of Othello, she's going to look on Cassio. A nay very voluble, no further conscionable than in putting on the mere form of civil and humane seeming for the better comforts of his salt and hidden loose affection. So he puts on, he's saying that he's, he's facile. And he's, he, he only has a, a civil front, and that uh, he's no more ethical, you know. 
than, uh, than the next man. So why none, why none? A slipper and a subtle knave, a finder of occasion, takes advantage of the occasion, that has an eye that can stamp and counterfeit advantages, though true advantage never presents itself, a devilish knave. So he sees advantages, um, or uh, he can create his own opportunities, even if the opportunity hasn't presented itself. A devilish knave, besides, the knave is handsome, young, and hath all those requisites in him that folly and green minds look after. A pestilent, complete knave, and the woman hath found him already. I cannot believe that in her she is full of most blessed condition. Um, and Iago swears and said, blessed fig's end. That was a swear word in, um, in Shakespeare's time. I think, uh, actually... Shakespeare's plays probably would be like PG-15 or something um, for all the swear words and uh... the wine she drinks is made of grapes if she had been blessed she would have never loved the more blessed pudding sausage didst thou not see her paddle with the palm of his hand did not mark that um, you know she, she was holding his hand uh, Cassio's hand Yes, that I did, but that was courtesy. Iago, lechery by this hand, an index, an obscure prologue to the history of lust and foul thoughts. They met so near with their lips that their breaths embraced together. So that's quite intimate that their breaths. You can imagine if it was a cold night and they were breath and they were talking that the that the the, the, the the mist from their mouths would entwine together. I love that their breaths embraced together, the burr. <laughs> Villainous thoughts, Roderigo, when these mutualities so marshal the way, hard at hand comes the master and main exercise. So, uh, in this case, when these intimacies have cleared the way, the major event follows. Um, the incorporate conclusion, pish, be sir, be, but sir, be you ruled by me. I have brought you from Venice. Watch you tonight, for the command I'll lay it upon you. Cassio knows you not. I'll not be far from you. Do you find some occasion to anger Cassio, either by speaking too loud or tainting his discipline, uh, insulting him? But from what other course you please, which the time shall more favourably minister? So, uh, you know, make use of the opportunity. Um, I'm sure you'll find one to pick a fight with him. And he argues, says, Sir, he's rash and very southern in cola, anger, and haply may strike at you, provoke him that he may, for even out of that will I cause these of Cyprus to mutiny, the, whose qualifications shall come in no true taste again. Uh, and he, So uh, here he's, he's setting up um, that, uh, that uh, if, he, if he starts a fight, then the other, the other guard will probably, uh, you know, they, they not good. Um, and he'll disgrace himself um, but by the displanting of Cassio. So um, the more will turn against him and uh, it won't... It would take a lot of grace and favours from Cassio to again regain his lieutenantship. Um, so it, well, he won't be reinstated easily. So shall you have a shorter desert journey to desires by the means I shall, I shall then have to prefer them. And the impediment most profitably removed, so with Cassio removed, he'll have, uh, he'll have uh, his way with uh, Desdemona. Without the which there were no expectation of our prosperity. So even though, you know, he's obviously second in line, with Cassio gone, he'll be the next in line for Desdemona. I will do this if you can bring it to any opportunity. I warrant thee, meet me by and by at the citadel. I must fetch his necessaries ashore. Farewell, adieu. And this is, uh, and Iago goes back into verse here. That Cassio loves her, I do well believe it. That she loves him, tis apt and of great credit. So yes, he can get people to believe she loves him. 
The moor, howbeit that I endure him not, is of a doesn't like him all that much, is of a constant loving noble nature, and I dare think he'll prove to Desdemona a most dear husband. Now I do love her too, not out of absolute lust, that her adventure I should account for as great a sin. Though he does he does love Desdemona. But partly led to diet my revenge, to feed his revenge, for that I just despect the lusty moor has slept into my seat, uh, slept with Amelia. This is, this is how twisted and sick this guy is. The, the thought whereof doth, like a poisonous mineral, gnaw my inwards, uh, his innards, and nothing can or shall content my soul till I am even with him, wife for wife. So. You know, he thinks that Othello slept with Amelia and he won't be, you know, he won't be appeased until, you know, he's revenged wife for wife, you know, losing, you know, sleeping with Amelia and losing um, Desdemona or failing so, yet that I put the moor into a, in, at least into a jealousy so strong that judgment cannot cure, which thing to do if this poor trash of Venice whom I trace for his quick hunting stand the pudding on, I'll have our Michael Cassio on the hip at his mercy. Abuse him, slander him to the moor, and in the rank garb, for I fear Cassio with my nightcap too, as a sexual rival, make the moor thank me, love me, and reward me for making me egregiously an ass and practising upon his peace and quiet. Um, undermining his peace and quiet, even to madness. Tis here, but yet confused, knavery's plain face is never seen till used. So, we've gotten to uh, the end of the first scene, which is a fairly long scene. Um, I'll just quickly read Act 2, Scene 2. It's just a herald reading and a proclamation. It is Othello's pleasure, our noble and valiant general, that upon certain tidings now arriving, importing the mere perdition, uh, entire loss, of the Turkish fleet, every man put himself into triumph, some to dance, some to make bonfires, each men to what sport and revels his addiction leads him. For besides these beneficial news, it is the celebration of his nuptial. So much was his pleasure should be proclaimed. All offices or um, storehouses are open, and there is full liberty of feasting from this present hour of five to the bell hath tolled eleven. Heaven bless the Isle of Cyprus and our noble general Othello. So it's party time because he's celebrating his recent wedding because they, they didn't get to consummate it um, before he had to leave for war with the Turks. So that's, uh, that's enough for now. So join me, join me soon for Act 2, Scene 3.